Hello and welcome to another episode of Julia Herdman History where we delve into stories about the people who made history. Today's subject is Cleopatra VII known as Cleopatra Philippator. Cleopatra a woman whose name would become synonymous with seduction. Was born in 69 BC. She was the queen of the Ptolemaic kingdom of Egypt from 51 to 30 BC. Cleopatra was the last member of the Ptolemaic dynasty and a descendant of its founder Ptolemy Sota, a Macedonian Greek general and companion of Alexander the Great. In 58 BC, Cleopatra went with her father, Ptolemy XII, to Rome after a revolt in Egypt placed his older daughter Berenice on the throne. Berenice was killed in 55 BC when her father returned to Egypt with Roman military assistance. When he died in 51 BC, the joint reign of Cleopatra and her brother Ptolemy XIII began. At this time, Rome was in turmoil. Civil war was raging between Pompey and Julius Caesar. When Pompey lost the Battle of Pharsalus in Greece in 48 BC, he fled to Egypt, but he found no support there. The young Ptolemy XIII had him murdered and Caesar captured Alexandria. Caesar favoured the older Cleopatra as ruler of Egypt, so her brother set siege to the palace with Cleopatra inside. Ptolemy XIII was killed in 47 BC at the Battle of the Nile, and Cleopatra's half-sister Arsinoe IV was exiled to Ephesus for her role in the mutiny. Caesar declared Cleopatra and her brother Ptolemy the 14th joint rulers but maintained a private affair with Cleopatra, who travelled to Rome as a client queen in 46 and 44 BC, where she stayed at Caesar's villa. After the assassination of Caesar, Cleopatra ordered her brother's death and named her son by Caesar, Caesarian, as her co-ruler, who was to be known as Ptolemy XV. After Caesar's death, Cleopatra sided with Caesar's grandnephew and heir Octavian, Mark Antony, and Marcus Aemilius Lepidus. After their meeting at Tarsos in 41 BC, the queen had an affair with Antony. She convinced Antony to dispose of her sister Arsinoe at Ephesus, and the pair set about founding their own dynasty in Egypt. Their marriage placed their children Alexander Helios, Cleopatra Selene II, and Ptolemy Philadelphus as rulers of the non-Egyptian territories under Antony's military control. This event, together with Antony's divorce of Octavian's sister Octavia Minor led to the final war of the Roman Republic, and also to the end of Ptolemaic Egypt. So what was Cleopatra like? Plutarch describes the last queen of Egypt as possessing an irresistible charm, a silver tongue and a great command of several languages. Lucan describes her lasciviousness as bringing disaster to Rome. In the same way, Helen was responsible for the downfall of Troy. According to Lucan, her physical awe was so powerful it was as effective as any weapon. Propertius, on the other hand, describes her as an impudent woman with no respect for Rome and its ways. Horace, went further still describing her as a fierce monster with very little femininity and Cicero. A contemporary and acquaintance of Cleopatra, railed against her insolence because she forgot to deliver him a gift she had promised. So, it seems no one had a good word to say about Cleopatra. Was this why she killed herself, or, was there something else going on? The American art historian Robert Bianchi, claims conflicting accounts of Cleopatra's suicide one were in circulation almost before her body was cold. He also claims Octavian would have savoured the thought of parading the defeated Cleopatra through the streets of Rome, and that this is the reason Cleopatra killed herself. But can we find out what really happened? The death of Cleopatra, the last ruler of Ptolemaic Egypt, took place in Alexandria on the 10th or 12th August, 30 BC. Cleopatra was just 39 years old. 
the Greek and Roman historians Horace, Plutarch, Livy and Cassius Dio give the closest contemporary accounts of the events at the time. Suicide, that is deliberately killing oneself, was practically unheard of in ancient Egypt. This makes the story about the end of Cleopatra's life all the more intriguing. The ancient Egyptians generally did not see suicide as violating their religious or legal codes. And there is no archaeological evidence of suicides in the ancient Egyptian civilization. However, literary texts such as Desperate from Life, an intellectual dialogue on despair, injustice, and corruption in the world, suggest that some people certainly thought about taking their own lives from time to time. There is some evidence that suicide was offered as an alternative to the dishonor of public execution for members of the elite. The famous judicial papyrus of Turin records the so-called harem conspiracy, a plot to murder Ramses III. The plotters were given punishments including public execution, suicide, flogging, imprisonment, and severing of the nose for their respective roles in the crime. Although we do not know precisely how individual conspirators were punished, members of the royal family were likely offered the dignity of suicide as an alternative to a public death. Suicide was however, a regular feature of elite Roman life. The Romans promoted the idea of patriotic suicide. To Roman nobles death was preferable to dishonor. However, was not an option offered to soldiers, enslaved people, and people accused of capital crimes. Plutarch's account of Cleopatra's death. Lucius Mestrius Plutarchus, circa AD 46 to circa AD 119, was a Greek Middle Platonist philosopher, historian, biographer, essayist, and priest at the Temple of Apollo in Delphi. He is known primarily for his lives a series of biographies of illustrious Greeks and Romans, and Moralia, a collection of essays and speeches. Shakespeare's play Antony and Cleopatra was inspired by Plutarch. His Cleopatra was the consummate manipulator who loved not Antony but power and pulled his puppet strings to make him dance to her tune. Plutarch's account can be no more accepted as fact than any other Roman account of Cleopatra, but it also forms the backbone of most Hollywood movies. Plutarch's account of Cleopatra's demise appears in Lives. He wrote, On hearing of Antony's defeat at Alexandria, Cleopatra took off to her tomb and ordered that an asp was brought to her in a basket of figs so that it might bite her. But when she took away some of the figs and saw it, she said, There it is, you see. And bearing her arm, she held it out for the bite. But others say that the asp was kept carefully shut up in a water jar and that while Cleopatra was irritating it with a golden spoon, it jumped out and bit her arm. But, says Plutarch, the truth is that no one knows what happened because she was also said to have carried poison in a hollow comb and kept the comb hidden in her hair. When they opened her tomb, they found Cleopatra lying dead upon a golden couch, arrayed in royal state, and of her two women, the one called Iris was dying at her feet, while Charmian, already tottering and heavy-headed, was trying to arrange the diadem which encircled the queen's brow. Then somebody said in anger, a fine deed. This, Charmian, it is indeed most fine, she said, and befitting the descendant of so many kings. Not a word more did she speak but fell there by the side of the couch. Plutarch concludes that the story of the asp was accepted by August Caesar as he carried an image of the queen with an asp clinging to her breast in his triumphal procession in Rome. Plutarch claimed that Caesar admired her lofty spirit, and he gave orders that her body should be buried with that of Antony in splendid and regal fashion. Her women also received honorable burials upon his order. When Cleopatra died, she was just short of forty years old. She had been the queen of Egypt for two and twenty of those years and had shared her power with Mark Antony for more than fourteen of them. According to some, Antony was fifty-six years of age, and according to others, fifty-three. In Rome, the statues of Antony were torn down, but those of Cleopatra were left standing because Archibius, one of her friends, 
gave Caesar 2,000 talents so that they might not suffer the same fate as Antony's. Livy's account. Titus Livius was a Roman historian. He wrote a monumental history of Rome and the Roman people, titled Abho Bacon Dita, from the founding of the city. Covering the period from the earliest legends of Rome through to the reign of Augustus, he was on familiar terms with members of the Julio-Claudian dynasty and a personal friend of Octavian, later known as Emperor Augustus. Livy wrote that after Caesar had reduced Alexandria and Cleopatra, he returned to the city to celebrate three triumphs, one over Illyricum, a second for the victory at Actium, and the third one over Cleopatra. This was the end of the civil wars, in their twenty-second year. Livy also wrote that when Octavian met Cleopatra, she told him frankly, I will not be taken as an achievement. In reply, Octavian only gave her a cryptic answer that her life would be spared. He did not offer her specific details about his plans for Egypt or its royal family. So, when a spy informed Cleopatra that Oct Horace is owed, Quintus Horatius Flaccus 65 to 8 BC, known in the English-speaking world as Horace was the leading Roman lyric poet during the time of Augustus, Nunc est bibendum or now is the time for drinking, or the Cleopatra Ode, is one of Horace's most famous works. Published in 23 BCE, it appeared as poem 37, in the first book of Horace's collected odes or Carmina. The poem tells the story of Octavian's defeat of Mark Antony and Cleopatra at the Battle of Actium. Neither Cleopatra nor Mark Antony is named in the poem. Some commentators say this is because Laurel Horace prefers to describe the war as one between Egypt and Rome and not between two Roman families or as a civil war, which it was. In the poem, Horace repeats the notion that Antony and Cleopatra killed themselves. Octavian intended to take her to Rome to be presented as a prisoner in his triumph. She decided to avoid this humiliation and took her own life. Finally, we come the account of Cassius Dio. Lucius Cassius Dio, circa 155 to 235 AD also known as Dio Cassius was a Roman historian and senator of Greek origin. He published 80 volumes of the history on ancient Rome. Beginning with the arrival of Aeneas in Italy, the volumes documented the subsequent founding of Rome, 753 BC, the formation of the Republic, 509 BC, and the creation of the Empire, 27 BC, and carried on until 229 AD, shortly before his death. Written in ancient Greek over 22 years, many of his 80 books have survived intact, or as fragments providing modern scholars with a detailed perspective on Roman history. Dia wrote that Cleopatra, on her part, and unknown to Antony, sent to Octavian a golden scepter and a golden crown together with the royal throne, signifying that through them she offered him the kingdom as well. She, it seems hoped that even if Octavian hated Antony, he would yet take pity on her. Caesar accepted her gifts as a good omen then publicly sent her threatening messages, including the announcement that, if she gave up her armed forces and renounced her sovereignty, he would consider what ought to be done in her case. Secretly Octavian sent her word that, if she killed Antony, he would grant her pardon and leave her realm in peace. Upon hearing Octavian's demands Cleopatra promised to give him large amounts of money, Antony reminded Octavian of their friendship and kinship, and made a defense also of his connection with the Egyptian woman, and recounted all the amorous adventures and youthful pranks they had shared together. Finally, Antony handed over his friend Publius Terulius, who was a senator and one of the assassins of Caesar, and offered to take his own life if Cleopatra might be saved. Caesar put Terulius to death, and sent no response to Antony's offer, so Antony dispatched a third embassy, sending him his son Antillus with much gold. Caesar accepted the money but sent the boy back. To Cleopatra, Octavian sent many threats and promises of love and loyalty alike, hoping to prevent her from destroying or absconding with the mountain of money she had stacked up in her tomb. In the meantime, 
Octavian's army proceeded to take the city of Pelusium in the delta, but believing Octavian's protestations of affection, Cleopatra forbade the Alexandrians to rise against him, and so he took Alexandria as well. She clearly expected forgiveness. According to Cassius, Antony took refuge in his fleet and was preparing to give battle on the sea or, at any rate, to sail to Spain. When Cleopatra heard he was taking her ships, she ordered her sailors to desert and moved into her tomb, saying she feared Caesar and would take her own life. Cassius interprets this move as an act of betrayal to Antony. According to Cassius, Cleopatra's cry for help would either make Antony rush to her side where she would kill him, or he would kill himself if he heard she had taken her own life. Either way, the wicked Cleopatra would ensure the end of the once noble Antony. Dio tells us that Antony went to Cleopatra's tomb dripping with blood because he had stabbed himself in the stomach when a friend refused to kill him. An implausible scenario. If you ask me, why stab yourself before you rescue your wife and the mother of your children? Nevertheless, Dio asks us to believe this and also that Antony died in Cleopatra's arms in her tomb while she waited for Octavian to forgive her. Dio claims she embalmed Antony's body and buried him. Then we are told Octavian removed anything she could use to kill herself from her apartment because he wanted her alive. However, he had not done with defaming her. A couple of sentences later, Dio describes how Cleopatra redecorated her apartment, added a golden couch and draped herself upon it invitingly, presumable for the benefit of Octavian, thus ignoring her wifely duty of mourning her dead husband, Antony. Cleopatra, we are told, convinced Octavius she would travel to Rome with him while she planned her own demise. Her plan was to die as painlessly as possible. Dio clearly thought she was a coward and a fully paid-up foreign, scheming slut. He tells us that after putting on her best clothes and draping herself in symbols of royalty, she lay on her golden coach and killed herself. So, what can we conclude from these historic accounts? The balance of evidence from the text suggests Cleopatra died by her own hand. Such as death would have been perfectly acceptable and even honorable for a defeated queen in Egypt. In DOI's version of her death, which is the most detailed, all the men are portrayed more honorably than Cleopatra. This is a typically Roman attitude to women who were considered to have transgressed sexually and betrayed their husbands. It was straightforward misogyny. A respectable woman in ancient Rome was required to keep a low profile. Women were supposed to be defined by their husbands, fathers, and sons. They were required to live faithful uncomplaining lives. Modesty and fidelity were the foremost virtues of a Roman woman. Virtues Cleopatra clearly did not believe in either because she was not Roman or most probably because she was a queen in her own right and not a consort. Whenever a Roman woman went out, assuming she was of noble birth, she would be escorted by slaves and chaperoned by relatives. She had to cover her body in a long gown called a stola, including her face. Over it, she wore a pallor or cloak. A noble woman's body was no business of anyone else except her husband. And, no respectable Roman woman would dare to be found lying around half-dressed on a golden couch. Especially when she was supposed to be mourning for her dead husband. Valerius Maximus writing in the century after Cleopatra's death, gives several examples of errant women being punished by their husbands. Ignatius Metellus, he tells us, bludgeoned his wife to death merely for drinking wine. Valerius tells his readers that far from being charged with murder, he received no public censure at all. According to Valerius, women needed to be kept under male control to stop them from scheming. The same view was espoused by Marcus Porcius Cato otherwise known as Cato the Censor. It is possible Octavius might have paraded Cleopatra at his triumph had she lived, but it is unlikely. Working on the basis Cleopatra was not a savage Gaul like King Vertingetorex who was publicly strangled during Julius Caesar's triumph and that she was the vanquished queen of the most culturally advanced nation on earth it is unlikely Augustus would have humiliated her. However, she was not a good example of womanhood for Romans. So it was open season on her reputation for authors like Dio, whether she had died at her own hand or from a tiny simple nut bite.
with the defeat of Antony and Cleopatra's fleet in the Battle of Actium. Octavian's domination of the Roman Empire was confirmed. A group of talented writers, who were his clients, provided the new emperor with a definitive interpretation of the significance of his victory for future generations of Romans. The poet Horace celebrated the return of peace and Rome's escape from Cleopatra's evil plans. In the Aeneid, Horace's friend Virgil interprets the significance of the battle in the broad sweep of Roman history, viewing it as the decisive conflict between the sober values of Rome, championed by Octavian, and the corrupt values of the Orient represented by Egypt and Cleopatra. Until recently, historians have seldom treated Cleopatra as a historical actor with clear and theoretically achievable policies and goals. Instead, the emphasis has been on her as a woman trying to act like a man, and as a woman consumed by ambition who used her sexuality to manipulate Caesar and Antony, ultimately corrupting them and destroying her kingdom in the process. Yet, all the evidence points to Cleopatra being an astute political operator. She may have used her sexuality to get what she wanted. But despite the claims of her unrestrained licentiousness, she actually had only two sexual relationships, one with Caesar the other with Antony. And she was, as far as we can tell, she was faithful to both. Similarly, she was faithful to her children and to Egypt. Cleopatra was the last stand, in many ways the most remarkable of the successors of Alexander the Great. For two decades she struggled to maintain the independence of Egypt and to restore it to the greatness. If you have enjoyed this video please, don't forget to press the like button. If you would like to see more videos like this please subscribe, and if you would like to support my work, why not skip over to my Patreon site where you can find more videos by me as well as get new and exclusive material first.